Welcome to the Mercy Cast, where we are learning the art of compassion through the adversity of life. I am your host, Raleigh Sadler, and over the past 10 years, I've started a nonprofit that helps people better care for their most vulnerable neighbors. Along the way, I've met a lot of friends who are on a similar journey, each of us learning new things about ourselves and each other with the more adversity that we face. We live in divided times. Often we have no idea how to handle it. We're tempted to either rush reconciliation or avoid the problem, pretending it'll go away. What happens when the division that you're experiencing is in a place where you least expect it, in a place where you are supposed to be safe? What happens when your church is divided? Jacob moved to New York to be the assistant rector of Calvary St. George's Episcopal Church, a historic parish in the Union Square area of Manhattan. Shortly after arriving, Jacob noticed a tension present in his own congregation. Though the church is to be one body, he noticed deep division along political and social lines. This was difficult because Jacob felt the tension in his own life as he has his own political and social stances. This stress led him to explore what could bring unity to this church. Today, I am joined by Jacob Smith, the rector of Calvary St. George's Episcopal Church. Here you are, fresh from seminary, and you find yourself in a tricky situation. I bet it would have been really tempting to force change, to say, my way or the highway, but you didn't do that. Jake, what did you do next? Well, at the time, and I don't know what it is in other churches' polity, but at the time, as an assistant, you do what your rector tells you to do. And my assignment was twofold. One was to start an evening service, and one was to start a midweek Bible study. And so I was the young, the new curate, the new person on the totem pole. And in seminary, I had studied under and been discipled by a wonderful, wonderful theologian and mentor named Paul Zoll. And it was during that time that I really learned about the gospel myself. And so, but I'd never, you know, I'd learned about it theologically, but experiencing it in practice in the congregation was just a very interesting thing. And so what I did was is I began a Bible study on the Sermon on the Mount and walked my congregation through the Sermon on the Mount and then just kind of began an evening service and where we put an emphasis on the preaching of the forgiveness of sins. And uh, what was very interesting to me was right away, people began to have questions and the questions were typically from both the left and the right. Yeah, yeah, the gospel, but... Yeah, yeah, the gospel, but we've got to do something. Yeah, yeah, the gospel, but that, but behavior modification. And so as the curate for a number of years, it wasn't my job necessarily to change the culture of the church. It's to serve the rector. But what I noticed was is that the gospel was offensive to both groups. I came from a very conservative um, theological seminary rooted in like kind of the reformed Episcopal Anglican tradition. and so. And I noticed when I brought the gospel, it was offensive to the conservatives who were like, yeah, but someone's going to get away with something. And when I brought the gospel to progressives and liberals, they were like, well, that's just such a negative view of humanity. And that's, you know, divine child abuse. And so everybody had their responses to the gospel. And what I began to realize in those first couple of years in my ministry when I was the associate, is that if you're politically conservative and if you're politically progressive, the gospel offends you. Or in other words, the gospel actually offends everyone. I've noticed just in my own ministry that as I'm trying to cling to the gospel, the things I say can offend people who are very far right and people who are very far left. Mm -hmm. And you're in this church and you're focusing where you're starting. You know, you have your evening service. But you mentioned something that I would love for you to explain to us a little bit more. You talked about the gospel in practice. Could you explain what that means? Yeah, well, I think there is the the teaching of the gospel that I was getting in seminary and the theologically the points and how it all like bundles up very tight and uh, is 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 a beautiful picture of God and his mercy. And and it makes total sense in the setting of a classroom and in, you know, in my own life. I actually came to know the gospel in seminary. You know, I had a perspective of the gospel when I went to seminary that 
you know, Jesus got me into the dance, but I better learn how to dance to stay in the dance. And uh, what I learned there was that the gospel was even for Christians, and uh, we need to be renewed with the gospel every day of our life, because I'm constantly trying to justify myself before God. This was very powerful and deeply resonated in me. And of course, everybody in my class was like, this is amazing. (laughs) This is good news. But now we are in a parish with real people and the stakes are very high. And so, um, you know, everybody has their positions and everybody has their claims. And so how does this work now in light of real people, real issues, real problems, no longer theories and essays, but actual flesh and blood folks? who have their convictions. And what does that mean? So that's what I meant practically. Yeah. So now you're taking this from a theoretical kind of safe educational situation. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And you're bringing it into real life Mm -hmm. where you have to believe it. You have to trust this because, yes, I feel like many people, we shift the gospel into something manageable for us so that we feel a little bit better about ourselves. But it still gives us some control. And the historic Christian gospel of Jesus living, dying, and rising for us, and what we see in the creedal formulations that have been passed down through the church, it's not a tame gospel. Mm. And so you are coming into this in many ways as a vulnerable person, because when I graduated seminary, I think I still thought Christians were nice people. Mm. You know, I still thought people of faith, and I'm not saying they're the worst, but I'm saying that on our own, we make a lot of mistakes and we hurt a lot of people and we've been hurt by a lot of people. And many who listen to this podcast have experienced church hurt or spiritual trauma. And so for us, when we hear about division in a church, it can be hard. It can, it can bring us back to something that we experience negatively. And so here you are coming as a young minister. Would you say during that time you were idealistic? And if you were idealistic, what happened a few months down the road? Yeah, definitely I was idealistic. And I would say what when I first came in and I thought everybody was going to glom to this and I was going to be the coolest person in New York City and all of those things. And it just doesn't work out because, you know, what the gospel ultimately says is it's not a message of do. It's a message of done, and it's been done in Jesus. And, uh, and a lot of people who come to New York City and are attracted to New York City are do kind of folks. And in the Christian circles, it's do it for Jesus. And so I think what happened to bust my idealism was life and, uh, and how right. it actually plays out and actually dealing with people who would quote scripture verses at me out of context, you know, work out your faith in fear and trembling. They don't ever say the second part, you know, it's, it's God's will to work this through you or, you know, we'll all stand before the judgment seat of Christ indeed. But the only reason why Paul would say that is because he's been covered in the righteousness of Jesus, not because he's standing in his own works. And so these little things. And so it began to play out. And, and eventually in uh, 2012, I became the priest in charge. And in 2017, I became the rector of the parish. But in In that time, I think it was just a life. And what happened was, is that the gospel, all the more working this out in parish became less and less theory and more and more of the very life preserver and life raft that I need to cling to. Um, And that would keep me sane. Because I think a lot of ministers, they take the gospel and they hear this good news of the blood of Jesus. And this is exactly what happened to me. And I see it as a means to an end. So this message is going to be the means to my end to a successful, cool church. This is going to be the means to my end to something or other. And what we begin to discover through life and something that we're continually learning is that the gospel is not a means to your end. The gospel is actually an end to itself. Mm. This is why St. Paul would later say, it's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I live, I live now by faith in the Son of God. And so that is what began to play out in me is that I had to begin to, I didn't begin to, it began to be pulled from me by God through many deaths and resurrections every single day, this idea that it's a means to an end. I've been now in New York City for 17 years, and that's still being played out every day, every day of my life, death and resurrection, as God continues to pry my plans out of my hands, and he begins to pry other people in my congregation's plans out of their hands, 
and leaves it completely empty so that all we can do is extend it Sunday after Sunday across the aisle to the communion table where Jesus meets us in bread and wine, and then we can extend our hands to each other, especially folks we deeply, deeply disagree with on horizontal things. Well, I love how you mentioned the personal deaths and resurrections in our lives, because one thing I've noticed that's very consistent in how you purport yourself in ministry is you will talk about how death happens to us, how no matter what we believe or who we are or where we've been, we will suffer. And because of that suffering, we are free in a sense. Mm. Could you explain what does it mean for death to happen to us? Yeah. What does that mean? Well, I think, you know, I'm, I'm oftentimes reminded of Jesus, and there's this wonderful scene, as specifically in Matthew's gospel in Matthew 16, but, you know, it's in Mark and Luke as well, where Jesus is walking through Caesarea Philippi. And if you've ever been there, there's these carvings in the wall that were dedicated to the different gods. The god of Caesarea Philippi was the god of Pan, the god of everything. And Jesus is walking there, and he's like, who do people say that I am? And then he says, and they're like, oh, some say you're this, some say you're that. And then he's like, well, who do you say that I am? And Peter says, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And then Jesus goes on to say, after he rebukes Peter a few verses later, he says, if any person want to follow me, let them take up their cross. And that is crazy talk. Nobody chooses a cross. A cross is flung on your back and it is the situation in life that you are given, where it seems like there's no way out except for the voice of God coming to you that says, I forgive you, I love you, and I will never leave you or forsake you. And the, that's the powerful thing is that the church, and this is tied into our history as well, is like the place that you should actually come not to get yourself together and improve yourself, but where you actually take up your cross and you hear God's words of forgiveness beckoning you towards him. And I think this is a big reason that you and I became friends. This is also a reason that we have partnered in different ways because let my people go. We want to empower local churches to fight human trafficking by loving those most vulnerable. Mm -hmm. And one of the things I live by is this idea that God motivates vulnerable people like you and me to love other vulnerable people by becoming vulnerable for us. Mm. And so really understanding that the things that we may hate about ourselves that we don't want to accept, the things that we want to deny, are the things that actually qualify us to care for our neighbor. Mm. It's that death that consistently happens to us. And that's why I loved that in 2016, I was able to launch Let My People Go at Calvary. And in 2019, I was able to launch my book Vulnerable Mm -hmm. at your church because I love your passion, what's happening at the church, but also the historic aspect because you probably had people in your church who are kind of living in the past of this is who we were. And what many of us may not know is it was at your church where Alcoholics Anonymous started. Mm -hmm. And so I would love for you to talk about the historical underpinnings versus kind of what's happening now. Mm. Well, I think what's happening now is the fruit of those historical underpinnings. It's the fruit of a lot of prayer throughout time. And we've been around since as a parish since 1747. So there's lots of ebbs and flows. But through that patchwork of faithfulness and unfaithfulness, through that patchwork, there is a consistency of the gospel and the idea of not only death, which is our vulnerability, but resurrection, God bringing us to new life and new understandings about who we are and what we're about in this moment. And I love what Sam Shoemaker says, and it, and it ties into what you're talking about. And Sam Shoemaker was interesting. He's preaching when he, he gives this talk. And he was a rector. He was the rector of Calvary Church in the 30s. And he is Bill Wilson, who's one of the founders of AA, credits him as the spiritual father of Alcoholics Anonymous and the spiritual father of the 12-step program. And so he's speaking in this time and, you know, If you know like anything about the 30s and the 40s, there was a lot of higher criticism about the scripture and and, uh, it was the beginning of one of the historical quests for Jesus and everybody was, you know, is God really necessary? And uh, Sam Shoemaker once said, he said, even if God isn't theologically necessary, now Sam Shoemaker believed he was theologically necessary. He said, even if God isn't theologically necessary, he is psychologically necessary because it is only God who can remove the human off the throne of his heart, a.k.a. his ego. 
And remember, never forget this. The ego is not your amigo. The ego is oftentimes what gets people into the biggest pickles of their life. Think about your own ministry and people who find themselves trapped in abuse and trapped in sl- like nobody wakes up one morning and is like, today I want to be abused. Today I want to be kidnapped. You know what I mean? Nobody ever says that. And, and the people who do that as well, I mean, nobody ever wakes up and is like, you know, today I want to be a trafficker. It is the ego. And this is why God is so important is because God is the only one. God is the only one who can remove the ego off the throne of the human heart and say, actually, you belong to another. And so it is before that God, and this is why what we believe uh, law and gospel is so important, the God of the law comes in and says, you shall have no other gods but me. And what this begins to reveal is that I have all sorts of gods. And then what, what must I do to be saved? Well, here comes the gospel. Repent and believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. And so often our ego in its own way is trying to save us. Uh, yeah, it's trying to save us, but it's not empowered to do that. It can't empower mm-hmm. what it's trying to do. Yeah, and this is why Jesus says anyone who chooses to save their life will lose it, you know? And so, so you have people in your church right now during this time period who they've come from this historic approach. Samuel Shoemaker had led really well. He had pointed them in a direction, but now in a sense, their egos are working overtime trying to save them through political divides, what have you. Well, it was and you're 75 years since he had been there. So, you know. Yeah, so I mean, he, he wasn't really around in a moment. Yeah. But you're dealing with a legacy and the history, but you're also trying to point them back, kind of almost like a renaissance. This is, yes, that's a great thing. And I think that is the defining aspect of once I, I am the rector now. And so that means that in certain places, I'm the senior pastor. And that is what I see my vocation as now, as the pastor of this church, is to, one, steward the legacy, make sure that it's talked about and that it is broadcast and well-known, not just in the church circles, but everywhere we go. And then the other thing is, and this is the thing with Christianity and what, what it's all about, is that existentially, when people hit crisis, they'll tell you, oftentimes, if they don't think it's a big deal, they'll, think, they'll tell you just to move on, get over it sweep it under the rug. And what this does is that this just creates a mess because sometimes you can't move on. And so in Christianity, we move forward by looking backwards. Now, what do I mean by that? We move forward by looking backwards. This is, this is how the people of God throughout the scriptures have moved forward. This is what in Come Thou Font of Every Blessing, one of the things I love every time we sing that song I love to put in the bulletin. How many of you actually know what an Ebenezer is? You know, here I find my Ebenezer. And there's always like one, but most people have no idea. They think Ebenezer Scrooge. An Ebenezer in the Old Testament is an altar that they would build to remind them of what God did. And so you remember Jacob built an altar when he saw the ladder. Israel built an altar whenever they conquered, like, a, you know, won a battle or something like that. And it was so that they could look backward to remember That's where God acted in history. And Mm. our Ebenezer as Christians is we move forward by looking backward. We look back to the cross, to the shed blood of Jesus, where we were given the assurance and the seal and the completed work of God that says, indeed, you are forgiven. You are the righteousness of God and nothing, not even what you do or don't do, can separate you from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. So we move forward by looking backward. And that's my job as a pastor is to take all of these people and not only just steward the legacy of the church, which is rooted in law and gospel, but to take them back to the cross, the real deal, and uh, in flesh and blood, and take them back there. And so that we might move forward as a redeemed congregation, people not standing on their own two feet, but on their knees, looking back at that, at that cross. And so therefore, then it manifests itself looking backwards into a redeemed future and how we handle our neighbor horizontally. And that can manifest itself in different political positions, but it tends to be one of care, one of conviction, and one of concern. And you talk about how redemption fuels this drive to love your neighbor. Yeah. And one thing that I love about your church is historically, it's always been a place that didn't just focus on one element. I think sometimes we can truncate the gospel and it's very easy to just see it through one lens. Like, Mm. 
will focus solely on the proclamation of the gospel, yeah. not the demonstration of the gospel. But you, as you have been preaching the gospel, you're also seeing the gospel hit other people in different ways. And it's it's not just spiritual, but like it's a holistic gospel. It's a holistic redemption. Mm-hmm. This idea of being bought back from slavery, mm-hmm. this idea of being bought for freedom, for mm-hmm. something new. And so what does that look like since you have been rector? What does it look like to see this holistic change? That's a great question. And let me tell you, if you are in ministry and you actually believe people are free, your entire ministry is about putting them in shackles because you're worried they're going to do something. You know, you're worried that they're going to listen. People are doing things and they're not telling you. And so if you realize that people are actually bound and the people coming through your church are bound, then your ministry becomes about setting them free, free with the gospel of Jesus. And how this manifests itself typically is in real, genuine acts of service, a real heart for people. I'll never forget, so one of the first encounters I had, we used to have a food pantry at a Calvary church, and people would come from all over that were economically challenged, and they would pick up a bag of groceries that would see them to the next paycheck. It was an important ministry. And I remember one, and that was one of the areas that I kind of oversaw on Thursdays. It had a wonderful volunteer team, but it was something that I oversaw as the pastoral presence. And I remember asking, I saw a new person there and I was like, hey, what brings you here? You know, and they were like, oh my gosh, Reverend, if you knew what I did, I was like, what do you mean? And you're like, well, I got a lot of things to work off. And so I'm here working these things off. That's not a free act. No, that is, that is trying to appease a God that you are afraid of. And that act compelled in a bad way. And guess what? (laughs) Guess what? That particular person came to the food closet three times. Then I never saw them. That kind of stuff, it may last for a moment. Just think about your New Year's resolutions or whatever. And you're doing it to appease someone. It never lasts. But what I begin to see now is, is that actually there is real work and that's coming out of a place of freedom. So The church is excited to host events that you put on because they know it's making a difference, not because we're trying to like win your approval or maybe, you know, be a little more socially progressive. We had our young adult group go and spend a Saturday not eating brunch, but going and bagging 50,000 meals that are going to Haiti to work with a church that we have a partnership with there because you can't trust NGOs. But they went and it's not because they're trying to earn, but because a group of people, this freedom gave them a heart for the people of Haiti. And now uh, we have uh, the same thing is beginning to happen as God is bringing us. You know, I thought it was going to be Guatemalans because the Guatemalan consulate is right across the street from Calvary. But we're getting a lot of Arab Christians that are starting to come to Calvary St. George's. And so out of the freedom of the church, God is leading us in a direction to service to support a hospital in Palestine that works with disabled children and, and, and mothers. And so But this isn't coming out of a place of obligation. It's coming out of a place of freedom. And the reason why I know it's coming out of a place of freedom is because it's completely and totally unexpected fruit. Mm. Like who would have thought, I mean, in the middle of New York, across the street from the Guatemala, we should be doing missions to Guatemala. You know what I mean? And that's what I thought. But God is like, actually, we're going to be doing this and you're going to be working with Arabs and Arab Christians and Arab Muslims in the Middle East to make sure that they get the care that they need in this war-torn area. You know what I mean? You're going to be doing packaging because you have a parishioner from Haiti who happens to have a heart for the place and can mobilize folks with the same heart. And so it becomes not about binding people. No, we got to focus on Guatemala because that'll make God happy. You don't know what we've done. No, it's about freedom. And so we're unleashing people, releasing people, unleashing them, literally releasing people into ministry that's bearing fruit. And it's nothing we would have ever expected. It's this idea of now that the gospel has shown us that we are loved by God, the vertical has been dealt with. Now we are free to focus on our neighbor. Yes, absolutely. And, you know, that's an interesting thing because on a number of levels, on a number of issues, I'm so I always tell people that um, politically or socially, politically on a number of things, economically, I'm Halloween, but socially, I'm All Saints Day, you know, and so um and uh, but that has brought a diverse crowd of folks, and and we have a lot of people who are coming uh, with all sorts of issues and from all sorts of various political backgrounds. And I always ask, why would you come to Calvary St. George's, both to conservatives and liberals? And they all say, uh, I've heard the, a promise. I've heard that it, God is for me. 
And really, I mean, that, that gospel, what the world can't seem to figure out over time, and it doesn't happen overnight, we are beginning to see the walls of hostility being torn down and people that 10 years ago would have never talked to each other are actually friends and engaged in service for their neighbor together. So you come to this church and you start where you are. You are showing that the gospel can be in practice. You're teaching it, you're applying it, and you're focusing on this message that's not do as much as done. And you are showing people that, yes, death and resurrections will happen in your life, but that will free you to love your neighbor. You can shift from this idea of gospel, but, and you can focus on done. That Christ, gospel. <laughs> yeah, the gospel that Christ has come to redeem and save the world. And for those of us who are navigating division in our communities of faith, in our churches, what are three things that you could encourage us with as we're trying to wrestle through this on our own? Mm. What are three things that I can encourage mm -hmm. people with as they're navigating the divisions in their own yeah. church? I would say, one, that the blood of Jesus is for absolutely everybody. And so whatever side of the fence people find themselves on, they've got a problem that only the blood of Jesus can pacify. They have a nag that only Jesus can meet. This is what makes us ultimately human. I would say that's the first thing is that the blood of Jesus is absolutely for everybody. Second, and I'll never forget, I have a friend, Nadia Boltz Weber, and she once said that if you find yourself deeply committed on one side of the fence, Jesus might actually be on the other. And to remember that everything that is apart from the gospel that we tend to hold dear, we need to make sure are not becoming idols. We can make idols out of everything. Idols aren't just little like statues on the mantle, mm -hmm. but we can make politics our idol. In fact, I would say that's where most Americans are. You know, they talk about, you see all these articles about the churches are emptying out. Where people are going is, is they are going to, they're finding their church and their political party and they're worshiping those particular gods and they're looking to make scapegoats out of people on the other side. And so that's the second thing is that you can make an idol absolutely out of everything and anything. And then the third thing is, is that when the gospel becomes prominent in your life, can you become so confident in the blood of Jesus and so confident in God's love for you? It might actually unplug your ears to hear the voice of your neighbor and their deep concern and their deep desire and what has placed them on that side. You may not have to agree with them, but you can begin to see them not as enemies, but as humans, because while we were yet sinners, while we, yet we were enemies of God, Christ died for us. And so you can extend a hand of fellowship to someone that you deeply disagree with. So sum it up. The blood of Christ covers everyone. Two, you have idols that need to be consumed by that blood. Think about the things that you're holding dear. And then three, you have not been defined by your idols, but you've been defined by that blood of Jesus. And so you can look horizontally at someone that you may disagree with and see them as a human being as well. And watch what God does. Jakes, thank you so much for joining me today. Oh, thank you, Raleigh, for having me. Such an honor and God bless you in your work. If you are interested in more conversations like this one, buy my book, Vulnerable Rethinking Human Trafficking. If you want bonus episodes, as well as a plethora of other resources, become a paid member at lmpg.org for $10 a month. You will get access to our bonus podcast, More Mercy, where we dive deeper. Also, don't forget to hit that subscribe button and leave MercyCast a five-star review. We want to hear from you, so you can email us at info at mercycast.com. Till next time. Have mercy on yourselves and each other.